Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, Harry will not be with us today. Uh, he is recovering from his pacemaker uh, installation. And uh, everything went well, and we're very pleased that there were no complications and everything is working very properly. But he said that just kind of wore him out a little bit, and so he will not be able to be with us today. And Angel and I are kind of doing double duty. I will be doing the first part of Harry's liturgical responsibilities. And uh, Angela will also be participating in the joys and concerns and the offering. So as far as our announcements go, big day next Sunday, we begin our fellowship. And uh, we've had fellowship long before just starting this coming Sunday, but we're talking about a fellowship of coffee and tea and uh, cookies and that kind of thing. So, uh, Pat, uh, is going to begin 30 minutes before our usual service or at 10 o'clock? Which, which is it? About 30 minutes. 30 minutes early, about 10, 15 then. Okay. All right, so it'll be around 10:15. Uh, so I hope that you'll come for that. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, we had our libation this morning to start with uh, when I came in the door. Uh, Ted took me back there and showed me water all over the floor in the fellowship hall that we've had a leak in the, the ceiling where the air conditioner builds up uh, overflow and uh, it's a long story, so let's just pray we can get that problem taken care of and uh, and get all of that dried up before it does damage to our floor. Um, any other announcements? Then this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand and welcome the Holy Spirit. Lord, indeed, every aspect of your being, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place because this is your house. And we are here in your place assembled to worship you, to minister to one another, to be ministered unto by your Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that indeed you will be glorified and honored through all that we say and do today. We pray that you will open the preacher's mouth so that the word can come clear and succinct. And, uh, and that word will touch our hearts and strengthen us and bless us. And we pray that you will open our mouths so that we may praise you and worship you and adore you in our hymns of praise. We pray that all things will be done to your honor and glory, for it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our loving Lord and Savior, that we do pray. Amen. Let us be called to worship now responsively. 
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Sovereign Jesus Christ. Because we have been strengthened by the grace of God, we are here to offer our sacrifices of praise. God will not forsake or abandon us, but promises justice to the upright of heart. If God had not been our help, our souls would have dwelt in silence. God is our stronghold and refuge. The steadfast love of God upholds us. When the cares of our hearts are many, the consolation of God cheers our soul. Let us worship our wonderful Lord now by singing a hymn. Our hymn of praise this morning is going to be on page 504, 504 in your hymnals, and entitled, He Touched Me, along with our theme this morning of touching the Lord. He touched me. Join me. touched you and came to live inside your life. Well, that was what we were thinking of when we prepared this message and song this morning. Let us be called to confession. The way of life God sets before us is not easy. The expectations God has of us challenges all that is superficial and routine. We are called to grow in faith and to share it, to be ambassadors for Christ in our daily lives, to be centuries who sound a warning against the wickedness we see around us. Let us confess how limited our response has been. Let us share together in our prayer of confession. O oh God, our transgressions and our sins are upon us. 
and we waste away because of them. We see evil all around us, but we do not oppose it, and sometimes we are part of it. We have not shared the judgment and warnings you make plain to us because we do not wish to offend or seem self-righteous. Therefore, the blood of others is on our hands, and that is even more frightening than our own personal guilt. Oh God, how can we be forgiven and find the life you intend? Help us, we pray. Amen. Hear the good word of our Lord. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. As I live, says the sovereign God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. God does not abandon us in our failures, but gives us or give us up or give up on us when we go our own way. When by our neglect we ally ourselves with systems and institutions that oppress. God calls us to new responsibilities. He teaches us new ways and strengthens us by grace that we do not deserve. We are forgiven. Let us live and serve as forgiven people. Now let us celebrate our forgiveness by singing the Gloria Patri, page 623. Please stand for the Gloria Patri and remain standing for the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> me to item number 716, the Apostles' Creed, and let us share together in our confession of faith. Church, what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And now we will have our time of joys and concerns. Yes, we do. And since Harry's not here, I get to, to do that. I, um, we, of course, want to remember Harry this morning as he is recovering from having his pacemaker um, put in. He's doing well. He's just a little weak this morning. He thought he might be here, but um, we, we gave him another week off. We said, no, we rest, brother. It'll be all right. It's okay. Anybody else have any uh, joys or concerns? Um, I, I know you do. I, <laughs> I still request 
thing has been added to the list that they faced. Uh, the upstairs air conditioning went out, and they have to have it replaced. Mm. Um, but I must say that when I talked to them last, they had just been to their church in Chattanooga, and the pastor spoke directly to them about trusting and knowing that God is in control. Mm. And for the first time since all this stuff has happened, I felt, I heard uh, that Keith was at peace. So that's that, wonderful. Was, uh, that was a, an answered prayer. Uh, still a lot to face, and you know, mm. but uh, God delivered that sermon directly to them. That's wonderful. You know, it, it's, <laughs> it seems like all our lives, no matter how old we get, how mature, are immature we are in the Lord we're always learning a lesson aren't we we're always learning and peace is one of those lessons you sort of have to build on that don't you I do anyway anybody else have any joys and concerns we certainly want to remember uh, Tommy while he's in care at the Tennessee Veterans Home uh, that he's doing better and well um, and our country, of course. Our country. We pray for our country every day, every moment, every remembrance we have. And pray that the, the people, the founders who, who instituted these rights that we have, that we, that we continue to have those rights. And we pray for those and we fight for those. Yes, Maggie? And that light, uh, there is going to be at the courthouse downtown, is going to be a reading of the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July, and I believe it's going to be at 5 o'clock, but I'm not certain. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's at the courthouse in downtown Cleveland on, yes. on July the 4th? Yes. Also on Thursday. Uh, at, you said you think it's 5 o'clock, a reading of the Declaration of Independence. I think that's the, day, the time it will be. Okay. There's also going to be one, I've heard that in, uh, in, in Chattanooga, and the Hamilton County Courthouse. There's also going to be a reading at 8, I think it's 8 a.m. though. <laughs> a little early. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Angela. Well, let us take these joys and concerns to the Lord. And I, th I think, uh, you know, one of the, the Joy, both joys and concerns that I would like to share with you is uh, something that happened this past week in the Supreme Court. Now, a lot of times what happens is the Supreme Court just kind of like, mm, just passes right on by our radar. But this particular decision made by the Supreme Court uh, decided in favor of a group of fishermen against the, I think it was the EPA or Wildlife Fisheries or some one of those alphabet organizations in Washington, D.C. that doesn't do anything but fine people if you don't do it the way they want you to do it. And they were fining these fishermen $700 a day for every day that they didn't have a, uh, a special employee uh, on board. They had one that was paid for by yours and my tax dollars, but then they wanted them to have a second one that was paid for by the fishermen that owned the company. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. And one of the alphabet communities, I mean, when I say alphabet communities, I'm not talking about gender. I'm talking about FBI, CIA, uh, any of these, uh, EPA, CDC, all of these different communities, whether you realize it or not, not a single employee that works for them are other than appointees by the administration, nobody elected them to do any job. And they treat the American citizen that way. So if you don't like the way we're running business, then we'll find you. 
and you'll, you know, you'll find yourself thousands of dollars in debt. This has happened too many times. If you don't believe me, talk to Rand Paul sometimes about some of the dealings he's had to have with bureaucratic organizations like this. But David won over Goliath a few days ago. So be grateful for that because that is paving the way maybe for future decisions by the Supreme Court. I'm very excited about that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we're so grateful that we don't have to orchestrate our lives, that we don't have to try to make every decision of what we do. Will we turn here? Do we turn there? Do we go in this direction? How far do we go in this direction? What do we do? But that you tell us in your word that if we trust in you, and lean not to our own understanding. In all our ways, we acknowledge you that you will direct our paths. Now, we know that those paths may not always be easy, that there's no easy street from following in your footsteps, Lord. And you said that if we want to be your disciples, we have to take up our crosses. We have to deny ourselves and take up our crosses and follow you. And so we are promised, though, when we do that, that you say that you'll be with us always. And you will lift us up and you will strengthen us. So I pray that any that is in our group, our family of faith, our extended family of friends, and anyone who worships with us, that that they would know your hand of good is upon them and your hand of blessing is upon them. And this morning, as we think about uh, how we are touching you in our prayers and in our lives and the way we're living, I pray that we are doing so in the right way. Now, Father, thank you for hearing our prayers now, for we are bold to pray the prayer that you, our Master, have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God seeks our steadfast love rather than ritual deeds. Our growth in knowledge and relationship to our Creator more than token contributions that only conceal from ourselves the poverty of our commitment. Come then to make a true offering that calls forth a dedication of self never before realized. And now we'll have a gathering of his tithes and our offerings.
stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Thank you, and now you may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Jack, for that uh, wonderful love story and reminding us that it's God's love that lifted us out of the mire and the sea waves and ever how that you want to craft your analogy. Uh, and, uh, and I have only one thing to say, Jack. Angela knows what that means. That's, that's the sign for ASL for... Because, why? They can't hear it either, right? They, and so they just go... And when you do this, have you ever seen people sitting out in the audience they're going... You know, they got sour, look like they've been raised on dill pickle juice. And, you know that, and uh, obligatory applause. Yeah. But you just can't do this without going. You know. So thank you, Jack. We appreciate you, brother. Uh, I want to invite you now to turn to Mark, the fifth chapter, and uh, we're going to look at. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, let's just go to Matthew first. Matthew 9, 19 through 22. I like to read the harmony of the Gospels when we can. Uh, it gives you the picture of all three of the accounts and how each one of the disciples that uh, hear Matthew, how he remembered it all happening. So Matthew 9, 19 through 22. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood for twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that very hour. Now let's see how Mark uh, would uh, tell it to us. He uh, tells us actually a little bit more than Matthew does. So in Matthew, excuse me, in Mark, the fifth chapter, we come to the 25 through 34. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse now you know we should be so grateful for the the medical and technology we have today it's amazing what what can happen in surgical procedures and other procedures that was just only fantasy 50 years ago, you know, even 10, 20 years ago. It's amazing. And so we can be grateful for that. But can you imagine what, what a doctor did back in the first century? How would you stop this problem? 
this was a very personal issue with this woman. And, uh, and she had to render herself before these uh, doctors. And it says she had suffered much because of this. I, I suppose embarrassment. And, and yet she was not better, but rather worse. And she had spent all that she had. And when she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? <laughs> and the disciples said, Really, Lord? There are, is a multitude of people all around you pressing against you. And you just ask who touched you? Do you want us to try to single this out? Now don't you see the multitude thronging you and saying, who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of your plague. Now let's see what Luke says. Luke 9 43 through 48. Luke 9, 43, 48. I think I've written this down wrong, so I don't guess we will look at that. Yeah, 9, 43 through 48. Yeah, okay. Anyway, basically says the same thing telling exactly what happened. Jesus touches us, doesn't He? And we touch the Lord in both good and bad ways. In the good ways, He was embraced. Many people, they had heard back then too. They loved to hold him. They were even more emotional. Like they kissed each other. But he was embraced. He even had his feet washed with a woman's tears. And she kissed his feet. And she dried her with her hair. And his disciples closest to him of all, John, his disciple that was called the one that he loved, used to lean on him and recline on him. I guess that was John's way of wanting to be closest to the heart of Christ. Huge crowds pressed against him. Others were incapacitated. who were uh, non-ambulatory. And they were placed by their friends on beds in the street so that they could reach up and touch the fringe of Christ's outer garments to be healed. And all who touched him, the scripture says in Matthew the 14th chapter, were healed. He had a woman's fortune poured out in ointment upon his head. So there were many wonderful touches of Christ in the New Testament. In Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who is not touched by the feelings of our infirmities, 
but was in all ways tempted as we are, yet without sin. So he knows the frailty of our human condition. And he loved being touched in the right way. But he also knew the bad touches of hatred and intimidation. And they also moved him to say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He knew what it was like to be spat upon and shoved roughly to the precipice of a cliff by his old classmates, the, the little town that he grew up in. He knew what it was like to be slapped and punched and then told to guess who did it. He had parts of his beard plucked out. He was crowned with thorns. He was beaten with whips and a cat of nine tails with which he was scourged. And he was shoved and mocked by soldiers and finally he was nailed to a cross and pierced with a spear and crowned with thorns. People just couldn't ignore Jesus. You know, they still can't. You either love him or you hate him. There's no middle ground. He has not allowed for any. He has not allowed for neutrality. Some have tried to be neutral. And you could even say that just they were trying to quietly use him. As this woman, you see, she just simply wanted to come in, touch his garment, be healed, and disappear in the crowd. But Jesus would not allow her to do that. We've already seen that she had, was being made very weak by her infirmity. She was also being made very poor because she had exhausted all of her money. But one thing that was not mentioned, and this is because it is taken for granted in those that knew the story, in Leviticus, the 15th chapter and the 25th through the 27th verses, she was considered spiritually unclean. And that was a great source of shame and guilt to her. And she was made to feel rejected by her own community, like a leper. And worse than all, she was even possibly felt rejected by God. There was fear in her life. But she had to do something. She was desperate. And so she decided to touch Jesus by faith. And he felt her touch. And, and he felt, the scripture says, virtue or power going out of him. And he said, who touched me? So that made the woman have to come and confess. She came in confession before him. I touched you, and I was made whole. She also had to come in contrition. She came trembling before him, the scripture says. Why? Because she thought that if Jesus was like all the other Pharisees and scribes and rabbis and that kind of thing, they would say, what are you doing here? Get out of here. You're unclean. We don't want to be unclean. And by the woman touching Jesus, even just the hem of his garment, he, according to the theology of that day, became unclean. Just like a leper touching him would make him unclean. But Jesus had a way of turning everything around, didn't he? The leper touched him, and rather than Jesus becoming a leper, the leper became clean. And this woman also became clean. And you remember I said she probably felt rejected by God? 
Look at what Jesus called her. Daughter. That's a very intimate term, isn't it? He said, daughter, go in peace. Your faith has made you whole. Be freed of your disease. In other words, you're not just healed of it now. You're healed for good. This is never going to afflict you again. What a glorious blessing this woman experienced because she reached out and she touched Jesus in the right way. And how do we touch Him in the right way? When we touch Him by faith. She no longer would feel hurt from that disease. She would no longer feel shame from that disease. She would no longer feel like an outcast. She would no longer feel rejected by God. But my question of the hour is, what made this woman think that she would be healed if she could just touch the hem of his garment? Well, perhaps it was superstition. Any of you ever kept a four-leaf clover in your billfold or purse or, uh, you know, rabbit's foot? Okay, we don't believe in that stuff, but it was fun, you know, to think about, you know, good luck, you know. Uh, superstition. Maybe it was sympathetic magic. You see, objects can have mana, according to primitive theologies. That, and so if something belonged to someone, that would be of great virtue and power. And before you laugh at that, what are relics but something that belonged to someone once? Usually bones or something of an apostle and that are in the cathedrals all around our world. Personal objects. But if one places their faith in something that is beyond the Bible, like a four-leaf clover or a rabbit's foot, I think they're making a very bad mistake. She placed her faith in Jesus' garment because that garment held a story. In Numbers 15, 37, God told Moses to tell Israel, make a garment and wear it for all generations. In other words, no excuses. You will always have this garment. And this garment will identify you as one of my chosen people. So if you have a tendency to stray and decide that you're going to go after other gods, every time you look at this garment, you will know that you are chosen and that you are a member of the family of God, that you are one of the people of God. This garment that you're supposed to wear for all generations you're to pass on the tradition to the next generation and the next generation. And no one who is following faithfully the commands of the Lord, according to Moses, will be freed from this responsibility. So they wore this four-cornered garment. It sounds kind of like a small blanket, doesn't it? Four corners was probably more in the shape of a rectangle than it was a square. But the garment had four corners. And at each corner, there was a tassel. And each tassel had a blue thread in it. Just one thread. Why? We'll, we'll learn about that in just a moment. The tassel was to remind each of the males and females in, uh, under God's commands, the mitzvah, his commands, 
And Israel was blessed in this way to be reminded that they were to be holy or set apart from all the other nations to remember they were the chosen of God. Now, what did each of these tassels look like? Each tassel was a braid of miniature knots. 613 to be exact. Why 613? Because the Torah law had 613 commandments in it. Two, 365 were prohibitive and 248 were obligatory. And it gave you 613. This garment that was worn all the time came to be called a prayer shawl. And if you've ever seen one, it is a white garment with blue thread. And uh, it is a person wears it for the purpose of prayer and for reminding themselves that they're always under the care and authority of the Lord. So these four cornered garments were intended to remind the Jewish people how they were to walk or to behave because the garments would hang down on their legs then they also would be reminded that I'm to walk with the Lord. And that was also a memory from the garment. It is believed that this tassel garment was also referred to as a mantle. Have you ever heard that term? In the Old Testament, Elisha said to Elijah, let your mantle fall on me. And that is possibly the prayer garment also. Jewish men would cover their heads with the prayer shawl or mantle when they prayed. And this was called entering your prayer closet because you would take the shawl, hold it by the corners, bring it up over your head and bring it down like this so you had shut out all that was around you. It was very effective because you could pray at any point, wherever you were, in any place. And the prayer shawl, it's called a talit, was, or talit rather, was definitely spiritual and it was meant to be a blessing to Israel. But the tassels were also a reminder of God's authority over their lives. And it also came to be symbolic of the authority that we have when we place ourselves under God's authority. Now let's remember that the tassels each contained a blue thread. Remember? Why blue? Because blue was a royal color. In the time of Moses, all the way up through the first centuries of the church, blue dye was the most expensive dye in the world. I'm told from my study that the dye came from a small snail from his mucus glands, and it took around 12,000 of these little snails to make a thimble full of blue dye. So you can see why there was only one small thread that was blue in that garment. It was so treasured that probably fathers passed on to their sons and, and grandsons and generations were passing down their prayer shawls. One can see how only the royalty and the extremely rich could afford these blue garments. So even just a thread of blue was a treasure. Sadly, though archeological anthropologists have tried to imitate this dye, no one has been able to. It is, uh, you know, sure, we have all kind of synthetic dyes today and we can make bright and brilliant blues and purples and everything else. But uh, 
They were trying to find out what was it that was produced, and they've never really been able to reproduce it because unfortunately it was such a secretive process. It was kind of like the Coke formula. Only a few people had it and they never wrote it down. And so it was lost in antiquity. And it didn't help too much that some Caesars, if you were ever seen wearing one of the garments that was made with this particular dye, in the case of the Caesars, they modified it to make it a purplish kind of dye. If you were found wearing a robe like that of the emperor, they would take you out and immediately have you executed. So not too many people were in a habit of wearing that kind of garment. Now, blue was also not only a royal color, blue was a divine color. It reflected the authority of the one who wore it. And by the first century, people were making bigger and longer and more elaborate tassels. Isn't that human nature? My tassel is longer than yours. My, I, I, am, I am richer than you are. I can afford a bluer tassel than you have, you know, that kind of thing. And unfortunately, it came to be a display of wealth and importance as well as piety. Of course, I'm pious and religious. Don't you see the length of my tassels? Even in 1000 BC, King Saul robe had tassels on the corners. When David ran into Saul in the cave, he secretly, quietly cut off one of those tassels. And you know why he felt bad about it? Because he had not just demasculated Saul, he had robbed him of his authority. That was a, an act of, of rebellion and robbing the king of his authority. And he had to stand before Saul and, and ask his forgiveness and to say, Saul, I'm not your enemy. You're trying to kill me. Everywhere I go, you're trying to kill me. And I had an opportunity to kill you. Instead, I cut off your tassel. Here it is. Saul looked down at his robe and went, oh. So, one other word we need to cover if we're going to understand why this woman thought, if I can but touch the hem of his garment. In Malachi 4.2, But unto you that revere the name of the Lord, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. Ever heard that expression? Well, what kind of wings did Jesus have? The word that is used there, kanaf, means feathers on the fringe or on the edge of the wing. So he would be perceived to be referring to the Messiah would have on his garments, tassels that were for the healing of the people. So this woman, she wasn't just shooting in the dark saying, well, this is a, this is a wild guess, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and I believe if I touch his, the hem of his garment, I can be healed. She was saying, I've heard he is the Messiah, the Messiah, Yeshua, Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah. And if he truly is the Messiah, then he has risen with healing in his wings. And if I touch his wing, which, you know, most of us don't have wings, but if we had a garment that we could stretch out like this and hold up, it would look like wings, wouldn't it? And on the fringes, the tassels. So we know that Jesus did indeed let people touch him and touch his garments. In Matthew the 14th chapter and Mark the 6th, the townspeople of Gennesaret 
brought their sick out on beds to Jesus and they laid them out in the streets so that he could walk between them and the non-ambulatory could just reach out and touch the bottom of his garments, his tassels. And all who touched them in faith were healed. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, the woman reasoned, I will be made whole. Now, faith must have a touching point. How and what is our touching point? To avoid our faith from just being wishing upon a Disney star or hoping that our ship comes in, how do we know our touching point is valid and not just some fantasy or talisman or good luck charm? Well, one, is it grounded or based on the Word of God? One. Two, is there conviction that comes from our trust in Christ's authority? And finally, three, the belief is supported by a scriptural promise. Here, the talith, the outer garment, was a command that Moses received from God for Israel. It was indeed a command from God. Secondly, the corners of the talith, the tassels reminded Israel of God's rightful authority over their lives. Two, and three, the scripture, Malachi 4.2, was a promise of the healing power of the Messiah. So the woman hit all three points. And in her faith, she reached out and touched him and was made whole. What is your touching point? Uh, the Roman centurion, it was the word. He said, just say the word, Lord, and my servant will be healed. Others, it was the word of prophecy to John the baptizer. Uh, his presence in worship. His real presence in the sacrament. His body, his blood. What are our touching points that God has given us? that we may exercise our faith. I hope you'll meditate on those thoughts and they will bless you and strengthen you as they have me in, in my personal devotion and that you will be encouraged by them and that we will use that encouragement to be agents of salt and light and ambassadors of the Lord's grace mercy, and peace. Let us stand together and sing our hymn of dedication. And all of us who have been touched know it. And whether Romans tells us that whether we live or die, we belong to Jesus. Thank God for that. Amen. Please turn to page number 511 in your hymnals, 511. Now I belong to Jesus and stand and let's celebrate belonging to him. Jesus. 
Jesus came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus. but for eternity. Joy floods my soul, for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood He gave to Receive the benediction, and now, Lord, as you have promised us in your word that you will never leave us or forsake us, and that you've held us close to your very heart, even as we have shared together in this time of worship, in this time of study, we pray that you have equipped us so that we may go out into this world, taking your gospel to a world that so much needs to know your grace and your love. Send us forth now, we pray, in the name of your personal name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And God be with you till we meet again. <clears throat> Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet, till we meet, God be with you till we meet again. Go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you.